is uh, a uh, a provider in our uh, 415 clinic there on uh, South Palm Canyon. And so I think it's South Palm Canyon at that point. But um, and he'll be able to tell you about his background. I'm always impressed with Don because he's uh, done a lot of lectures for us and a lot of different things that, that coincide with very specific topics and um, gastrointestinal and a lot of different things that uh, he excels in. And so he has a, a very broad-based background. And with that, I'm just going to kind of pass it off to Don, and he'll give us a little bit of his background, and we'll go from there. So, yep, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Brett. Thanks, Candace, and uh, welcome. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about colon cancer, screening for colon uh, and rectal cancers, um, uh, which affects pretty much everybody um, uh, as we get to a certain age. Um, and we'll uh, go through some of the specifics. Uh, first, some. Uh, we do have someone in the waiting room, it looks like. Um, we do? So, yeah, well, that's what my screen is telling me. Um, uh, but my screen has lied to me before. Um, uh, so uh, colon cancer is actually the fourth most common cancer that's diagnosed in the United States. Um, <clears throat> I, will, I can't see my entire screen here because uh, we've got a window over to the side. Um, but uh, nearly 150,000 new cases, I think that says in 2019, um, and 51,000 deaths in 2019. Now, we've been hearing some scary statistics about uh, numbers of cases of things and deaths uh, lately, uh, but <clears throat> 51,000 is a, a, a significant number, right? Um, and 4.2% of people will be diagnosed with colon cancer in their lifetime. So it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. Um, uh, okay. So um, the trends, um, uh, as you can see, these are two different ways of um, looking at the trends in colon cancer um, uh, as, we, as we progress through time, right? The top one is new cases diagnosed per year. And the bottom one is deaths. And you can see that they're both going in the right direction, right? They're both going down. Um, and that's what we want. And uh, we're pretty much um, convinced that the reason that these two trends are going in the right direction is because of screening. Um, we can go to the next slide. Right. So what are we talking about? Um, we were actually talking about this a little bit before um, before the meeting started. So um, uh, uh, welcome to your colon, right? And you will see, this is not a mistake, on the left-hand side, you'll see that it says right. And on the right-hand side, you will see that it says left. Um, but this is your colon as you're facing it, right? So if this were your colon, it would, you would be turned in the opposite direction, facing in the same direction as this picture. So if you take your right hand and put it kind of down over your hip, that's on, on your right side, on the same side, that's where you see the cecum, the appendix, and then you see that little, um, that little sort of tube, the open-ended tube sticking off into the center of the picture there. That's where you're exactly right. Um, that's where your small intestine joins to your, to your large intestine or your colon. Your colon is the same thing as your large intestine, if you remember that from your seventh and eighth grade science classes. Um, but let's go back just a second to where we were. Um, and so uh, food as it works its way through your digestive system enters the colon from the small intestine right there in the area of the cecum. And then it goes up. And that's why that part on the right-hand side is called the ascending colon, right? Because you can imagine that the, the, um, uh, uh, it's fecal matter at that point, um, but very, very watery as it, uh, in the beginning there. It's go, it goes up to the hepatic flexure. Hepatic just means liver. And the only reason it's called that is because that your liver is right there. So it's kind of named after your liver. 
Um, and then it goes across from the right to the left, right, from the hepatic flexure toward the splenic flexure. And that's called the transverse colon. And then it goes down into the descending colon, which is your left colon on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and then it goes into the last part of the colon, which is called the sigmoid colon, and then into the rectum. So that part that's uh, vertical there um, uh, is the rectum. And that is essentially where the stool is stored until it's time to move it out of the body, right? And have a bowel movement. And the very end is the anus. And the anus is a, what we call a sphincter muscle, a circular muscle that closes everything off except for when um, stool is coming out, right? And maybe a couple of other different activities. All right, next slide. Um, so colon cancer, I wanted to just mention two different ways that colon cancer gets staged. Um, because in hearing about colon cancer, you might hear both of these um, staging mechanisms referred to. So one of them is by stage, right? And if you look all the way to the left, you see stage zero, and that's really a polyp, right? So you can see that it's just sitting on the outside of the, of the, uh, of the colon itself, right? It hasn't worked its way into the underlying tissue. I don't know if you can see my arrow, um, but here at stage one, the, the uh, growth has kind of worked its way into the first couple of layers of, uh, of the interior lining of the colon. And then at stage two, it's, it's all the way through the lining of the colon. And then stage three, now it starts being invasive and moving out of the colon. And stage four, now these cancer cells are traveling through your blood vessels and your lymph vessels to other parts of your body. Um, obviously, the earlier you catch something, the less complicated it is to do something about it, okay? So now we can have the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so these are the more um, uh, uh, recent um, guidelines for uh, staging colon cancer, and they're called the SEER stages. And you see at the bottom, SEER stands for surveillance epidemiology and end results. So it's really much more, rather than based on what's happening on the inside that you can't see, it's more based on how we approach and how we deal with these things when we find them. So when it's localized, it means that there's no signs that the cancer has spread, right? So that's that stage one, maybe early stage two. Regional means that it has spread to nearby structures. Right, and then distant means it's spread to further parts of your body. Let's say the liver is an, a frequent place where uh, cancer travels. Um, uh, and, and then there are others, uh, depending on how late in the game it is, it could be to the bone or it could be to the uh, other parts of the abdomen. Um, all right, let's look at the next slide. So what are the colon cancer survival rates? And here's where the SEER stages are more important, right? So these, this is five year survival based on SEER stage. And when it's localized, see the, the survival at five years is 90%, right? And when there's regional spread, there's still 71% survival, uh, not as good as 90, but not that much of a drop off. But look what happens when the cancer has spread distally, uh, like to the liver or to the brain, um, the five-year survival is really pretty bad, right? So it, I, we probably didn't need an argument for why we should screen for colon cancer and find it early, but here you go. If the earlier we find it, the better your chances are of surviving. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so how do we define colon cancer risk, right? Because you'll hear that. Um, and how we screen for colon cancer uh, depends on risk or, you know, how much risk, right? So average risk, right? Uh, average risk means adults age 50 and over. Um, and that's where 90% of colon cancer occurs in adults 50 and over, 
right? So there's some colon cancer that uh, occurs in younger adults, um, uh, but that's 10%. 90% of it is uh, 50 and over. And this is a key for why screening w is important and works, right? So, so that's, uh, that's who's at risk, right? Now, who's at increased risk? Who's at higher risk, right? So, okay, fine, you're an adult, you're 50 or more, but if you have a family or personal history of colon cancer or polyps, right? So family history means a first degree relative, and a first degree relative is a parent, a sibling, or a child, and you know, not Aunt Sadie um, necessarily, although we might still wanna know that, right? Because it could combine with other things. But if it's a first degree relative who has either had colon cancer or polyps, or if you, and that's a personal history, if you as the patient have a history of, obviously if you have a history of colon cancer, but if you have a history of polyps, that also increases your risk, right? And then there are certain diseases, and these are not uh, terribly common GI diseases. Um, I think we get into that a little bit later in the slides those can increase your risk of colon cancer. The most common of those is something we call inflammatory bowel disease, um, and especially ulcerative colitis, um, increases your risk of, uh, colon, of developing colon cancer. And then there are lifestyle factors that put you at higher risk. So uh, people who have what we call a sedentary lifestyle, who don't get much exercise, <clears throat> people with obesity, um, and people who smoke. And of course, you know what our recommendation is about those things. It's uh, get up and move around, uh, you know, do your best to lose some weight uh, and address uh, being overweight and uh, for goodness sake, don't smoke. Um, uh, another thing is the risk of colon cancer increases with age, right? So keep that in mind, just because you've had a couple of negative colonoscopies, as you get older, your risk of developing colon cancer is higher. Um, and lately, we've had some increases uh, observed in younger populations, especially of rectal cancer. So um, you'll see some more about that in a second. Um, okay, we're ready for the next slide. So I thought I'd take a step back because I find patients are often confused uh, because we use some of these terms um, and their insurance companies use some of these terms. Pardon me. And um, it's worth knowing the difference. So when someone like me uses the term screening, um, we're not talking about something we put in the window. Um, we're talking about looking for something before there are symptoms, right? So if you come to me and you say, I have a stomach ache, and I do a couple of tests to try to figure out why you have a stomach ache, that's not screening. Uh, and the reason it's not screening is because you already have the stomach ache, right? Um, when we screen for colon cancer, it means that we're looking for something that isn't causing you any problems yet, right? Um, uh, if, we, if you come because you've got, uh, uh, come to the office and see me because you have diarrhea or you have constipation, and we decide that we need to do a colonoscopy in order to try to understand why you have these problems. That's not a screening colonoscopy. It's the same procedure, but we're doing it for a different reason. Um, and so that is the difference between a screening colonoscopy and a diagnostic colonoscopy. Um, when we screen in medicine, um, it means that we increase the chances that if you have a cancer, we will find it in the early stages, right? Versus, you know, cancer grows, as you saw in the slide back there. So you can imagine that if you have a colon cancer that's growing, it can grow to the point where it obstructs your colon, and then you won't be able to poop anymore. Uh, and that's a, a problem, right? So then if we do a colonoscopy, we find a big obstruction, um, uh, it's, it's probably going to put you into that category of the 14% who survive at five years. And we'd rather have you in the category of people that survive at the rate of 90% um, at five years. So, 
So we wouldn't want to wait until the cancer is that far along. Now, colon cancer is um, easier to screen for compared to some other cancers, right? Um, uh, so by easier, I mean uh, colon cancer lends itself to screening. Another cancer that lends itself to screening is breast cancer, um, which is not the subject of today's lecture. But um, name another cancer that you've heard of, maybe pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer does not lend itself to screening, right? So if we go looking for early signs of pancreatic cancer in people, uh, it doesn't result in a change in the um, rates of survival of people with pancreatic cancer. And there are all kinds of reasons for that, and we're not going to go in depth about pancreatic cancer. I'm just making some comparisons here. But why is colon cancer easier to screen for compared to some other cancers? Well, it's higher risk in older people. So by research, we know who we should look for, look for colon cancer in. We know who's at risk, um, and we know who, uh, it, you know, where to, where to target these screening efforts, right? So we don't go around screening 10-year-olds for colon cancer because they don't really get it, right? But 60-year-olds, on the other hand, do. So we do screen 60. Another reason that colon cancer lends itself to screening is we have these precancerous growths that are called polyps. And <clears throat> if someone has a polyp, it's not cancer, but it could turn into cancer, right? Um, and one of the methods we have for screening for colon cancer, we can actually usually get rid of the polyp all at the same time, right? Um, so that's another reason why um, it lends itself to screening. And the other reason why colon cancer lends itself to screening is because it progresses very slowly. There are cancers that move very, very quickly. And so by the time, um, uh, by the time you have your initial symptoms that might not even necessarily, there are certain brain cancers that work this way. People come in and they talk a little bit about their feeling fatigued or whatever, very general symptoms. Um, and then a couple weeks later, they're having trouble walking or talking, right? So obviously, it, 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 in, in two weeks' time, it would be difficult to do any kind of intervention that would have prevented that from happening, unfortunately. But it would be nice if all cancers lent themselves to screening the way colon cancer does. Um, all right, next slide, please. So what are polyps? Let's get into that a little bit, right? So they're small abnormal growths of tissue. Um, uh, a normal colon is sort of uh, wide open. Uh, uh, you get from one end to the other um, and kind of a nice uh, smooth wall. Um, uh, polyps look like little bumps. Uh, sometimes they're mushroom shaped and they stick out from the wall of the colon into the what we call the lumen or the, or the open space in the middle of the colon. Um, and by age 60, um, uh, we can all raise our hands now if that's us because we can't see each other, right? Um, you have about a 25% chance of having a colorectal polyp. So that's one in four. That's, that's a large number, right? There are different types of polyps, so keep that in mind. Some polyps can turn into cancer over time. In most cases, they do very slowly, right? Okay, next slide, please. So how do polyps progress? Well, this might look a little bit like the other, um, uh, the other uh, picture, right, with the, with the uh, colon cancer. But uh, see how here all the growth is on the inside of the, of the wall, right? So the, um, the lower part of the slide, the bottom of the slide, that's the, the outside of the colon wall. And then the, the sort of the pink shaded area on the inside is the interior of the colon. And you can see the wall of the colon is not affected by these polyps, even as they get bigger, right? So, um, and then you see down below, um, uh, so benign means good, that's why it's green, and malignant means bad, right? So there's this hyperproliferation, which is just, you know, sometimes a barely noticeable bump. 
And then you get these uh, adenomatous uh, polyps, either small or large. That's the vast majority of polyps that we find are adenomatous polyps. And then there's severe dysplasia, which is now the precancerous polyp. That's something that we really want to keep our eye on, right? So if, if you have a colonoscopy and we find an adenomatous polyp, then we're going to say we want you to do the next colonoscopy five years later. Once you're into severe dysplasia, we want to do that sometimes in one year, sometimes in three years, depends on how large it is, right? And then on the right side, you see that these are, these, these are now cancerous polyps, right? And uh, first is an adenocarcinoma and then an invasive, um, I think that says cancer, um, uh, to, the, to the far right of the picture. So these are, um, these are cancers for which you'd be referred for treatment, right? But we're still catching it before your colon is obstructed uh, and hopefully before it's, um, uh, progress to other parts of your body, right? But by doing colon cancer screening at the intervals that are recommended, we catch almost everything on, you know, on the benign side of the, um, of, the, of the picture there. And that was not the case years ago before we were screening the way we are these days. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so how do we screen for colon cancer, right? Because there are different ways of doing it. Most people screen for colon cancer um, by getting a screening colonoscopy. Um, and a screening colonoscopy or any kind of colonoscopy is where um, you're lucky enough to drink um, a whole lot of liquid that cleans you out um, over the couple of days before the procedure. And then you go, um, you get a little sleepy medicine um, so that you don't feel it. And then a gastroenterologist introduces a scope into the anus and then traverses the whole colon. It goes up, uh, goes up and over and up again and over again and down. Um, and basically then surveys the whole colon visually looking around for those polyps that you saw in the picture before. Um, and then if those polyps are there, with that same scope, um, we're able to snip them out and recover them and so that we can send them to the lab and find out what, uh, what they're actually uh, comprised of. Um, there is a, 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 an imaging, a CT scan basically, that's called a CT colonography, um, which is a virtual colonoscopy. So everybody says, well, that's great. It's just a CT scan. It's not, um, having that whole big long scope stuck up your butt. Uh, and that's true. Uh, the downside of a CT colonography, besides it not being quite so good at finding the smaller um, uh, lesions that you saw in the picture, is that you still have to do the clean out and that's the part that everybody hates, right? The colonoscopy itself, because of that uh, sleepy medicine you get at the beginning, um, is the part that everybody says, well, that's no problem. It's the clean out that I don't want. Um, and both of those tests, because they're visual, means that you need the colon to be clean in order to see. Because you can imagine what a mess it is if you don't do that. Um, uh, okay, so what else? We have uh, stool tests. That's where um, we do different kinds of tests on, <coughs> excuse me, on the, um, uh, on, on, on your poop, basically, on the stool after it comes out. And one of them is called an immunochemical test, and the other one is a DNA test. Uh, the the uh, brand name is called Cologuard. Uh, so the fecal immunochemical test is basically a smear, and the, uh, the Cologuard is a stool collection, and you do that at home. I think you do actually do both of these at home. Um, and they're looking for DNA. Uh, the, the, the problem with these tests is they don't differentiate between um, uh, um, uh, polyps and more advanced adenomas and cancers. So we, we just get a basic positive. And once you've got a positive, then you still need a colonoscopy. Um, and at that point, uh, it's considered a diagnostic colonoscopy. We get into that a little bit uh, more later, what the implications of that are. 
Um, okay, and so tests that used to be done that are no longer recommended, one of them is a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a colonoscopy, but just in that last little part of your colon um, uh, uh, before the rectum. Uh, it is where an awful lot of colon cancer occurs, but not all of it. Um, and so it's a, an incomplete colonoscopy. It is possible to do sigmoidoscopies without the anesthesia, so there's not that risk of the test. Um, uh, but it, it, it misses enough colon cancer that, it, like it says, it's no longer recommended. Maybe you've had one in the past, but <clears throat> those are no longer offered. Um, for screening. Uh, so, and then the last one is a fecal occult blood test, uh, which is also a stool test with a smear, but um, uh, it's just looking for blood. And there's all kinds of reasons. There could be blood in the, um, uh, in, in the stool, not necessarily colon cancer, right? So, uh, so not, not a screening test for colon cancer. And Andrew, I saw your question. Um, I'm go we're going to uh, sort of zip through these slides, and then we'll get to the questions at the end, so hang on. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So um, what are the advantages of each of these screening me methods, advantages and disadvantages? Well, some of this is going to be repetition, but with the colonoscopy, you get to see the entire colon, uh, uh, all the way up to the cecum. Sometimes they can poke up a little bit in there and take a look at the very end of the small intestine. Um, uh, with the colonoscopy, you can biopsy and remove polyps um, all at the same time. Um, uh, you can diagnose other conditions if they happen to be there. And the best news is if it's negative, if they find nothing, and if you're at average risk, meaning you don't have a history of polyps and you don't have a, a family history of colon cancer, then you don't need another one of these for 10 years. 10 years. Nice, right? If you do, well, we'll get to that in a second. The disadvantages, of course, always are the prep, that, uh, that big long drink that you have to do for two days. Um, you may miss a small polyp, right? Um, you will find some of these disadvantages in common with other screening methods, by the way. Um, the colonoscopy is the most expensive of these uh, methods. Um, and there are potential procedure complications, right? So you do get um, uh, sedation uh, or anesthesia. That's where most of the risk is. Any procedure like this, of course, you've got uh, a risk of uh, uh, doing some kind of damage to the inside of your colon or uh, uh, perforation, which is where you poke a hole through the colon. These happen very, very, very infrequently. Um, and the risk of these uh, complications uh, tends to go up as you get older, right? So someone, for example, with uh, complicated heart disease who's at average risk, uh, when someone has complicated heart disease, that makes anesthesia very um, uh, risky. Uh, so that's a person for whom a cologuard would be the perfect test, because then if it's negative, you're done. You don't have to do any anesthesia. Um, and you don't even have to do the, the clean out, really, right? Uh, somebody with mobility problems, right, who can't walk or can't walk very well. Um, if you've done this, you know how, you know, the night before you're back and forth to the toilet, um, that can be a problem, right? So we take all these things into account when we decide um, what's the best uh, method to recommend. Um, okay, next slide. So the FIT test, the fecal immunochemical test, um, has the advantages that it's inexpensive and that there's no prep, right? And there's no direct risk to the colon, so you're not going to do any damage there because you're not going in, right? And you do it at home. Um, the disadvantage is you may miss some polyps. Remember that from the, uh, uh, from the previous, right? You can miss small polyps. Um, the FIT test also has a, a bit of a failure rate in terms of some cancers, right? And then um, false positive, right? So if you have this test, screening tests like this generally are designed to have very, very few false negatives, right? So a false negative means the test says that you don't have cancer, but actually you do, right? 
So we want to minimize that, right? But usually when these tests are calibrated, it means if you want minimal false negatives, then you have more false positives. And a false positive is the test says you do have cancer when you don't, right? So when you have a false positive, that means you need a colonoscopy, which is where you could have started and then you would have been done by now, right? Um, so that's why you may still need a colonoscopy. Anyone who comes to me thinking they can do one of these tests because they really, really just want to get out of the colonoscopy, I warn them that there's a decent chance that they'll need a colonoscopy anyway, right? So it, you're not, it, it's, it's not time for a victory lap just because you decide this is the right test for you. Um, uh, and the other disadvantage is in order for this to be effective, it needs to be done every year, not every 10 years. Uh, okay, next slide. So a stool DNA test, which is the Cologuard, has a lot of the same um, risks as the uh, FIT test. Uh, it's just a bit more accurate, right? So there's no direct risk of the colon and there's no prep and you do it at home. Um, you may miss some small polyps. It is done every three years instead of, if it's negative, it's done every three years instead of every year. Um, you might still have a false positive uh, but false uh, negatives are not so much a problem. Um, and if you do have a positive, uh, false or otherwise, um, you may still need a colonoscopy. Now I bring up insurance because uh, most insurance plans, we were talking about this earlier, most insurance plans pay for screening tests um, uh, at 100%. If you do a Cologuard, that's your screening test. If the Cologuard comes back positive, that means that the colonoscopy is not a screening test, it's considered a diagnostic test. And so that is um, uh, going to be viewed by your insurance company as a diagnostic test and then reimbursed however your insurance reimburses diagnostic procedures, which could be 80% of a procedure that they would have paid 100% for if you had just done it in the first place. Um, uh, and the, uh, the colonoscopy, uh, you know, like, like we said previously, the Cologuard test is expensive, but the colonoscopy is more expensive. So, um, so that's worth considering because, uh, you know, um, uh, not everybody's got uh, unlimited uh, resources to throw at this endeavor of uh, colon cancer screening. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so a CT colonography, which is a CT scan. Um, the advantages are, once again, there's no direct risk. You're not introducing a foreign body into the colon. Um, uh, you do get to see the entire colon this way, and you don't need any sedation, which is um, where some of the risk goes. Um, and if this is negative, it's recommended every five years. Um, the disadvantages are it's the same prep as the colonoscopy. Um, may miss some small polyps, uh, like some of the other ones, right? There's a false positive rate. So um, if the test comes back positive, you do then still need the colonoscopy. Um, CT scans expose you to radiation, uh, a good amount of radiation. Um, and keep in mind then that's that um, dose of radiation every five years. Um, and it's the same insurance implications as the Cologuard. This would then be considered your screening uh, procedure, and then the colonoscopy would be the diagnostic procedure. Um, I have to say we don't do very many of these. Um, we either do a Cologuard or we, um, uh, or we recommend the colonoscopy for different reasons. Okay, next slide, please. So who should be screened? Um, uh, these recommendations are based on large population studies that have been done. Um, uh, and uh, we get back to the phrase average risk adults. Those are people who are at risk, but not at any increased risk compared to other groups of adults the same age. And that group is age 50 to 75. Uh, so all the different uh, societies that make recommendations uh, uh, including the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which is the source here, um, uh, says that people age 50 to 75 should be screened according to the guidelines that we've just reviewed, right? 
um, those methods and at those screening intervals. The American Cancer Society is so far still alone at recommending that we start uh, screening at age 45. Uh, and that's specifically because of the increased uh, uh, obser observed rate of rectal cancer in younger people. There aren't population studies to support this though. So the US Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend it because there's not solid evidence behind it, um, according to them. Uh, and therefore, most insurance companies that would cover someone age 45 to 50 uh, uh, don't, don't reimburse for this because the US Preventive Services Task Force doesn't recommend it. So just because the American Cancer so Society suggests it, it's still not really happening. Um, and there are studies ongoing, so that could change, um, uh, uh, probably will change eventually, um, but uh, so far, no. But if you see discrepancies in recommendations, that's the reason why. Different, um, different uh, uh, bodies that review these things uh, look, at different, uh, look at different sources. So uh, if you are an average risk adult older than 75 years old, um, that does not mean we don't screen you because we don't care about you. It means that you may benefit from screening, but in some cases screening may, the risk may outweigh the benefit. Um, and those people need to have a conversation with their healthcare provider uh, about what they want and what, uh, what is recommended for them. So what do I mean by that? Well, as people get older, they tend to have more chronic illnesses. Those put them at higher risk for complications from a colonoscopy, things like anesthesia. Um, as you get older are more difficult. Um, going through the prep is more difficult as you get older. Um, and uh, uh, the likelihood that you could die of something else uh, goes up as you get older. It's uh, just how epidemiology works, right? On the other hand, if we have a 70, a, a spry healthy 80 year old and we catch a colon cancer early, that means we've avoided having to treat them for full blown cancer when they're 85 or 90 years old. So, um, so those are the kinds of things that get taken into account. Um, and, and we do a thing that we call individualize, um, which means we decide based on the particular person what the risks are and what the benefits are of screening, right? For adults older than 86 year old, the risks really are greater than the benefits and screening for them is not recommended. So you probably will have a hard time if you're older than 86 finding a gastroenterologist who will screen you. Um, uh, they would have to make a very convincing argument for that. Um, okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, so we'll review this. What's average risk? No history of colon cancer or polyps uh, in, in, the, in the person, in the patient, right? In the person to be screened. No family history of colon cancer or polyps, right? And that's by family, we specifically mean a first degree relative, parent, sibling, child. No inflammatory bowel disease, that's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, and no hereditary colon cancer syndromes, uh, uh, usually referred to as Lynch syndrome. Uh, if you have that, you would know about it, right? Um, but uh, interesting here because you know we're, we live where we live and we have a demographic, right? I think the average age of a patient at Eisenhower is somewhere in the mid 70s. <clears throat> so for the average patient at Eisenhower, it's too late for early screening. Um, uh, but it, all those folks have histories and most of those folks have families and it's very important to get a good idea of what your history is uh, from your healthcare provider so that you can pass it on to your family members who might be at risk because of your history, right? So I always add that for people. Um, it's not just about you, it's also about other members of your family, your kids, your grandkids, and their kids. Um, uh, the, more, the more they specifically know about your history, the better they're gonna be able to protect their own health uh, down the line. 
Next slide, please. Um, so who's at higher risk? Those who have had colon cancer or polyps, those with a family history of colon cancer or polyps, um, those with inflammatory bowel disease, and that's uh, once again, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, um, uh, hereditary colon cancer syndromes, like I said, Lynch syndrome, and there's this uh, uh, f familial adenomatous polyposis. Um, that's a whole lot of polyps, right? Just a whole lot of polyps, and it's a hereditary syndrome. Uh, uh, so if a family member of yours has it, it's a, uh, a, you've got a higher risk of having it yourself. Uh, people who are overweight or obese are at higher risk. Um, alcohol or tobacco use increases your risk. A sedentary lifestyle um, and poor diet all increase your risk of colon cancer. Next slide, please. Um, so when we screen for high risk, uh, how does that change things, right? Well, it depends on what the risk factor is that's making the risk higher. Um, family history depends on how closely you are related to the person with colon cancer, and very importantly, when were they diagnosed? So I've, uh, I've screened patients for colon cancer who were in their uh, early 40s uh, because they had an older sibling who was diagnosed. And then you uh, start screening five years, sometimes 10 years before the age at which your family member was diagnosed. So if they were diagnosed at age 45, you would start screening either at age 35 or 40. Sometimes it's hard to catch a sibling 10 years earlier. Most siblings are not that far apart in age, but sometimes they are. Um, so in any case, then you just screen as soon as you know, right? Um, and then modifiable risk factors, as we call them, tobacco, alcohol, and inactivity, should always start with modifying the risk factor, right? So. Um, a more aggressive approach to uh, quitting smoking, um, uh, losing weight, and uh, getting active, right? Those, those things often go together anyway. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, here you go. These, these guidelines get more and more complicated as we dive into them, right? Um, and you're, uh, uh, they're available to look at online. Um, uh, so it's probably worth researching. But if you've got a first-degree relative diagnosed before age 60 or two first-degree relatives that are diagnosed at any age, you want to start screening 10 years before the relative's age at diagnosis or at age 40, whichever is younger, right? So a first-degree relative is diagnosed before the age of 59 means you would start screening either at age 49 or 40, right? It means you would start screening at age 40, if you, if you catch it that early, right? Um, and no matter what is found on that initial colonoscopy, you do your next colonoscopy in five years, even if the colonoscopy, uh, the initial one is negative. Um, so if you have one first degree relative diagnosed at after age, at or after age 60, you start screening at age 40 and you repeat in 10 years if negative. Did I get that right? Someone who can see the whole slide? <laughs> um, okay, next slide, please. If you're older than 75, as we said before, have you been screened in the, these are the questions you ask yourself. Have you been screened in the past? What was the result? How was your general health? Um, would you elect to undergo treatment for the cancer if it were found? Um, and make sure your family members know your, your history, right? So uh, if you were diagnosed with colon cancer, it's important for your family members to know that so that they can be properly screened. Uh, next slide, please. For more information, these are uh, uh, places I re <coughs> recommend. All kinds of people can post all kinds of things on the internet. And if you have someone who had some uh, calamitous event happen because of a colonoscopy or a, um, uh, or a prep or something like that, 
uh, please remember that these are individuals and we don't base screening guidelines on what happens to any one particular individual. Um, uh, even if what you're reading is true, uh, it could be that, that uh, that's just what happened to that one poor unfortunate person uh, and the thousands and thousands, millions of people that we screen for colon cancer without incident um, benefit from uh, prevention and early diagnosis by doing so. So um, you'll find good evidence-based recommendations at these different uh, websites. Um, uh, the Mayo Clinic website, by the way, has really good uh, health information on a lot of different diseases. Um, it's easy to understand and find, and it's uh, sort of easy to know where to go for more information. So I recommend that website a lot to my patients for all different, um, for all different kinds of information. Okay, and I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So there we are at 415 South Palm Canyon, um, the gastroenterology practice. Um, it's uh, Dr. Mamta Mehta and I. Um, uh, she's a gastroenterologist, I'm a nurse practitioner. We mostly work together. Um, so most of our patients know both of us. Uh, she does the colonoscopy. She's um, meticulous and, uh, and terrific. Uh, most of the time we want a, a referral from your primary coming in. Um, so we know why we're seeing you and we know what's been done uh, up until the point where we take over. So we don't repeat things. Um, and uh, any questions, you can certainly get in touch with us. Um, and I think I see a couple of questions in the queue. So let's uh, have it. Do you, uh, can I pull up these questions all by myself? Oh, can, you, can you read them? I, it looks like I can. Yes, and if I you hit the you. chat button, you should be able to see them. Um, so the first question from Andrew to everyone is, is there a difference in accuracy between the two stool tests and the answer is yes. Um, the Cologuard, um, I don't have numbers for you. I could get them uh, in terms of accuracy, but the Cologuard, because it uses a larger sample of stool, um, pardon me, is more accurate than the, than the FIT test. Um, uh, so, so uh, and that's one of the reasons why you do the Cologuard every three years and you do the FIT test every year. Um, uh, so that if you've had a false uh, 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 negative result, um, uh, it, you won't go more than a year before uh, you get another chance of uh, having it come out uh, accurately. <clears throat> um, uh, and the other question from Candace is, what does complicated heart disease mean as opposed to just heart disease? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question. Uh, so, um, uh, most people don't consider a simple hypertension, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol to be heart disease. Um, they're sort of precursors to heart disease. So uh, heart disease um, is roughly uh, split into three different um, categories, right? So there's blood vessel disease or coronary artery disease, um, uh, where you've got plaque buildup in your arteries. Maybe you've had a heart attack. Um, <laughs> if you've had a heart attack, then you've probably had a catheterization and stents were placed. Um, uh, and so once you've got stents, especially if you're on blood thinners, um, I would call, I, I, don't, I don't know that I would call that heart disease, but that's significant heart, that is heart disease, right? Um, uh, another kind of heart disease is um, what we call heart failure. Which is, um, which is kind of a terrible name for it because uh, to me, heart failure means a heart that fails. But actually what it means is a heart that's not working as well as it used to. And uh, who, who among us are working as well as we used to? Let's face it, yeah. right? Our hearts are no exception. But so there's a difference, right? Um, and that uh, the quickest way to measure that is by doing an echocardiogram. And if your uh, cardiac output is a certain percent, then it might be uh, slightly diminished or severely diminished. Um, and as it gets worse, it's, it's more complicated. 
And then the other factor that goes into heart disease is valve disease, where the hearts, uh, where the valves inside your heart aren't working as well as they should. Um, but heart and lung disease are particularly um, of concern when you're getting anesthesia, because anesthesia slows everything down, and um, including your uh, your heart and your respiration. And so people with uh, uh, heart or lung compromise are specifically further compromised when they get anesthesia. And that's why anesthesia, uh, even sedation, right? You get very minimal anesthesia for a colonoscopy, but you do get some. And depending on how involved your heart disease is, um, you, you might, um, uh, your, your risk is increased. Uh, when, when people like that come to us, generally speaking, they're already under the care of a cardiologist. And uh, the reason you have a screening visit with me before you have your colonoscopy with Dr. Mehta is that's one of the things I go over. And if you are under the care of a cardiologist or a pulmonologist, I let them know that we're planning to do a colonoscopy. And these are the things that we've recommended. And what do they suggest in order to what we call optimize or uh, lower your risk as much as it can be lowered? Or do they say, no, uh, Candace's ticker is just too bad. She should not have a colonoscopy. The risk outweighs the benefit. And then we go to, and then we go to a colagard. Gotcha. All right. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, we went a little bit over, but that's great because we started a little bit later. So thank you, everyone that was participating tonight. And thank you so much, um, Donald, for your um, information tonight. It's, it was really well presented, and I know so much more than I did before this started. So that's what this is all about. So I hope great. everybody benefited, too. Good. Brett? It was it? great. Thank you. No, oh, thank you very much. I'm glad this all worked out. Okay. Always informative. Great. Um, next week we have.